What's the difference between a chess beginner and a chess intermediate? Well, in this video, we are going to find out. We're going to have a look at a game played by Jim Berger. And you're like, who, who the hell's Jim Berger, man? Jim Berger is a longtime friend of the Light Squares YouTube channel. He's been watching for a long time. And because of that, he's going to become one of the greatest players of all time. And so he is currently rated 1000 on chess.com rapid and has kindly said we can go over his games. And being a player that is rated 16 to 1700, I'm not that much better than Jim. However, when I looked at this game, I could see some clear differences between the way he was thinking and the way I would think. And so we're going to explore this mindset difference as opposed to just going through boring engine variations, which let's face it, none of us would find. Okay, so Jim is playing the world famous Krishna 8624 who opens up with D4. It's not best by test. We have B6 from Jim. Ah, B6 against everything following Lawrence Trent's course. Thanks, Jim. I plant seeds and crops grow all around YouTube. It wasn't for me, yeah, guys. We'd have another C6 against everything player. We don't want that. We want some balance, guys. We have c3 from Krishna, bishop b7, e3, knight f6. And so this is all things I would do here. Okay, when your opponent is making these kind of passive pawn moves in the center, uh, very important to just develop your pieces. Also, don't do anything crazy. Don't underestimate your opponent's ability to defend a position. Although this is quite passive from white, it's solid because they're going to play knight f3, bishop e2, maybe bishop d3, maybe knight to d2. And okay, the whole thing's a cure for insomnia, but it's ultra solid. Okay, you're not going to be breaking this down anytime soon. Just, just stay calm, develop your pieces. We have here h3, e6, I love it. Getting ready to liberate this bishop here on f8. We have knight to f3, d6. And so this is the first place in which I would diverge from Jim. I would not play d6. So as a rule of thumb, if you can play c5, you should play c5. Okay, not in all cases, sometimes playing c5 is a mistake or a blunder, but in many openings with black, in many variations, c5 will be a move. Okay, in e4, e5 games, it won't be a move normally because it will create a massive hole here on d5. However, in many other openings with the black pieces, you're looking for the c5 move, it contests for the center, hits the d4 pawn. But also, we don't want to develop our knight in front of the c pawn. Okay, so just following basic principles here, c5 challenges for the center. And if they decide to take, we have bishop takes c5. That would just help to develop our piece. Or maybe even b takes c5 if we're worried about b4. Okay, but ultimately white would be uh, eliminating a central pawn in such a variation. And so if you can play c5, you should do it. We have d6, not losing. We have a3, knight to d7, getting ready to support c5 here. Queen to a4, I'm not sure what that's about. And in this position, I think Jim does what I think a lot of people in and around his level do, which is they just remove tension for no reason. And so he plays this move, bishop takes f3. And so one of the things, mindsets we've got to have is that tension is our friend. I used to do stuff like this when I was 1,000 rated. You just start trading down. Maybe you get scared about blundering material. So you're just like, okay, let's just simplify the whole game. But then when you do that, you end up with some kind of end game, which is maybe theoretically a draw. And you're just basically chucking a coin to see whether it's going to land in your favor. You want to try and create tension in the game to try and induce a mistake. And here, bishop takes f3 is weak. The engine says it's fine, but it's you're eyeballing it looks weak because after something like g, g takes f3, the lines have been opened up to the black king. And so you'd have reservations about castling short. But also notice white setup right white has all these dark square pawns and so has all these light square holes and so you could argue that this bishop on b7 is just a piece that can move around the board it's a good piece and you're just helping white by giving it up so we have bishop takes f3 g takes f3 bishop b7 bishop g2 castles and now we have this move f4 and so what well on for what well on to jim for seeing that his rook was hanging many times i would just blunder the rook uh, you can get into a habit of just paying attention to one corner of the board. He plays this move d5, shutting down the, the diagonal. And in this position, we have here rook to g1. And so herein lies kind of the challenges, what I was talking about before. Okay, this rook on g1 isn't a threat at the moment, but down the line, it could be. And so you just create an unnecessary complication in this game. You want to avoid stuff like this. 
we have c5 okay great you can play play as i discussed above we have knight to d2 c takes d4 the engine wasn't too keen on this however it's a move that i would play because in both variations either e takes d4 or c takes d4 black is gaining something and so after e takes d4 you've got these structural weaknesses here you've got these isolated pawns on the f file and imagine a rook end game you would target pawns like this you try to win one of them maybe two of them and just try to win the game in the simplest possible way alternatively after c takes d4 queen c7 followed by rook c8 keep an eye on this a7 pawn is very natural and in a position like this with the lines opened up on the queen side it's virtually impossible for white to castle long and so white's king is stuck in the center so i would have taken uh, however the engine for some reason doesn't like it but from a human perspective it's understandable we have king to h8 it's not a move i would make although there is an x-ray uh, if you look at the position of these pawns and how mobile this bishop is it's not getting to h6 anytime soon and so it's not a move that you need to make uh, sometimes we sort of are overly cautious in games sometimes one of the best ways to play is assertively here definitely queen c7 uh, is a strong move it would allow for rook c8 getting this rook out of this diagonal uh, in this position we have b4 and so as soon as i saw this move a whole bunch of other moves came to my mind and so when your opponent plays moves like this what have they done they have created an outpost there's an outpost here on c4 and what's an outpost it's just a square that cannot be challenged by another pawn and so if you were to land say a knight on c4 then the only way white can remove that is by trading it off but in which case they run the risk of uh, black creating a passed pawn and so they've created this structural weakness on this side on c4 and so one of the moves i was thinking about was e7 d6 c4 however the problem with playing knight to e8 excuse me uh, not e7 is e4 looks annoying and so in this position i think i would have still gone with queen to c7 and notice in this position after queen to c7 it's quite a positional move as well they can't move their knight because if they move their knight queen c3 effectively check wins the game okay so their knight is sort of stuck in that position however jim goes with this move a6 uh, knight to f3 b5 the queen's got to move we have queen to b3 knight to b5 with the clear intention of doing what i discussed above which is to get this knight onto this beautiful outpost on c4 however notice that the way in which jim has done this has come with a cost which is that white has its own outpost on c5 and so in this position i would have avoided this a6 b5 maneuver because it would create a lot of kind of complications if say this knight was to somehow make its way to c5 in which case if we had to get rid of it white is going to create a pass pawn but this is not the way i would have done it okay but this will happen in the game we have knight to e5 queen c7 we should be two okay white has a decent outpost here if he can get to it black has this great outpost here on c4 we have knight to c4 very very natural move and in this position i think white comes up with the absolute worst possible move just basically throws away the whole game and they long castle and it's all over and so obviously you do your tactics puzzles the whole time you know how to win this game there are many ways to win this game the way jim goes with it is not the way i would go with it because i think it allows counterplay so what jim does in this position is he plays knight to e knight takes e3 and check the king moves we have knight takes d1 root takes d1 and so okay this is obviously totally winning for black however there was an alternative way to have gained three in material so notice in that permutation you gave up a knight for rook and pawn so you gained effectively three pawns in material However, another way you could have done it was just to play knight takes e5. Check. The king's got to move and put the knight back. And notice how this is just stronger. Because this knight is the best piece on the board, you want to preserve the best piece. And it's very difficult for white to get an attack going because white will always have to think about this knight. This knight could 
in time play a role in checkmating the white king. And so if you can preserve your best piece in some attacking sequence where in both cases uh, it's winning, you want to choose the option uh, which allows the least amount of counterplay for your opponent. But anyway, knight takes e3, okay, it's still winning. King b1, knight takes d1, rook takes d1. Knight to e4, I wouldn't play this. Uh, because after bishop takes e4, d takes e4, you just have this loose pawn on e4. And now you have to spend some time in the game thinking about how to defend it. So queen e3 is a very natural move. Let's say queen b7. And the position has just become a little bit annoying because your most powerful piece is tied down to the defense of a pawn unless you want to give it up. And so knight takes e4 would definitely not have been uh, on my radar. Maybe something like knight to d7, uh, maybe the rook moves across, queen b7, okay, trying to trade off some pieces, or maybe rook c8 in this position, okay? And so we have knight to e4, bishop takes e4, d takes e4, king a1, bishop h4, queen to e3, rook d8, rook c1, queen b7, knight to c6, uh, rook d6 hitting the knight, knight e5, f6 hitting the knight, knight c6, okay, and the game's gone, rook takes c6, queen takes e4 is not a move, always check for checks, this rook is not pinned because of this check, and so in this position, Jim obviously doing his tactics puzzles all the time, rook takes c1, check, bishop takes c1, queen takes e4, and of course Krishna does the right thing and hits the resign button, uh, there's no way you're going to save this game. And so, is there a huge amount of difference between the way I would have played this and, say, Jim? Uh, not a lot. However, there are these little, little things that you need to think about. The, the C5 push, uh, the maintaining of tension, the thinking about outposts, which probably makes up the difference between my level and his level. Hope you enjoyed that video. Thank you very much for your time. Leave a comment below.